Coming up on Market to Market, the president again throws a hard line into complicated waters on NAFTA. Researchers seek insight from the total eclipse of the farm. And making hay cuts across many interests in the land of 10,000 lakes. Those stories and market analysis with Darren Newsom next. Wherever your operation takes you, or who you share it with, we'll be where we've been all along. With you, from the word go. Proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company, offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, August 25 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. Mike Pearson is away this week. Hurricane Harvey is forecast to be the worst storm in a dozen years and is headed for the Texas Gulf Coast. If the prediction holds, he will leave feet of rainfall on the fertile region. Another unwelcome late summer guest is the bear in the housing market. The Commerce Department said sales of new homes plunged 9.4 percent in July as supply failed to keep up with demand. Buyers also are retreating from existing units as that rate fell 1.3 percent in light of fewer properties coming onto the market. A decline in demand for civilian aircraft sent orders for durable goods tumbling 6.8 percent in July, the largest drop in nearly three years. Without transportation, orders for long-lasting items rose half of a percent. This week, at a speech in Arizona, President Trump renewed his criticism of NAFTA just hours after the first round of talks concluded. Hear his comments in a story on our website at iptv.org slash mtom. From sea to shining sea, nearly everyone put down their devices and looked to the sky on Monday. This week was the first total, total solar eclipse exclusive to the continental U.S. since 1776. As Josh Bittner reports, the eclipse was more than just using glasses for a spectacular view. That's so pretty. This week, the Great American Eclipse first broke the nation's plane in Oregon and tracked across the continental U.S. before taking an off-ramp at South Carolina. And while onlookers were enraptured with the scene above, some in the heartland turned their gaze to the ground. We figured we have a one-shot deal with this, and we're trying to make the most of it. Tim Reinbot is the director of field operations at the University of Missouri's 1,200-acre South Farm Research Center in Columbia. The town's prime viewing location along the path of totality presented a golden opportunity to document plant and animal reactions to the anomaly. Are well, the chickens going to go in their coops? Is the, is the rooster going to start crowing? There's lots of things that we don't know. What we hope is that this will further our knowledge of what makes plants tick, what makes animals tick. You might say, how's that going to affect food production? Just think, if we know more about how plants respond to light, maybe we can start pushing production of different food crops further north or further south where light is different. Several experiments were carried out and later compared against typical conditions. Drought tolerance, circadian rhythms, and aquatic conditions were also explored. We're also supposed to have some people come fishing during the eclipse and kind of measuring the fish they catch to see if there's any correlation between kind of how many fish they catch or the size of fish um, at different times during the eclipse. Parts of Missouri and nearby states were overcast, but South Farm bucked the trend and lived up to the hype, providing a clear line of sight for the eventual 2 minutes 37 seconds of total eclipse. Oh, that was amazing. 
it was unbelievable how fast it got dark. And then um, the corona, unbelievable. Thank God the, the clouds moved off right, right when it happened and we got to see everything. As with any theory, unforeseen results can arise when tested. Students and staff were surprised by some reactions to the eclipse. So it's back to the books and, and trying to learn some more things about what's going on. <laughs> you know, that's what science is about. Reinbot says some of the animal feedback could be tougher to decipher because of the short time span of totality. But he points out another opportunity in 2024 when the eclipse phenomenon that captivated the nation will make a comeback not far from his doorstep. That's going to go to southeast Missouri. Yeah, seven years now. We'll start, we'll start planning now. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Late this week, Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke recommended to keep recently added national monuments on the map. Changes to the size and scope, as well as the potential for more drilling and mining, has some environmentalists wanting more details. It's grassland in Minnesota that has legislators and landowners debating the fate of more than 175,000 roadside acres. Colleen Bradford Krantz has the story on the important source of hay and wildlife habitat. For generations, Minnesota farmers have made a habit of mowing and making hay from the grass growing in roadside ditches. But in the past year, state officials began increasing awareness of an existing but largely unpublicized and unenforced law that had, since the mid-1980s, required farmers to obtain permits for such work. There's been a greater emphasis of understanding what all of the different benefits that occur in the right-of-way. And probably the largest has been expansion of interest uh, to spread out to pollinators, the monarch butterfly, and that escalation really had other people coming to the department and asking us to step up the enforcement of the statutes that were in place. State transportation officials say boosted enforcement guidelines would have required farmers to have, among other things, a $1 million liability insurance policy with the state listed as one of those insured. It was um, shocking to all of us that the permit had been on the books for a long time and never enforced or ever dealt with. We had never heard of it, period. Grant Breitkreitz used to bale hay on 120 miles of roadside ditches in the early years of his cattle operation. The work returned more than 700 additional bales a year for feeding his cattle during the winter. According to state officials, the 1980s era law was originally designed to give the offspring of ground nesting birds, like pheasants, time to hatch and move on before the ditches were mowed. Since the measure was rarely enforced, Farmers mowed and made hay in the ditches in late June and July, as they had for generations. State Representative Chris Swazinski, who farms in southwest Minnesota, was frustrated with the ban on mowing and baling the ditches before August 1st, and was among the legislators who last spring successfully placed a one-year moratorium on all enforcement. When someone goes in the ditch in the wintertime, we're the ones that go fix the ruts. We're the ones that replant the grass in those spots. We're the ones that pick up the garbage and, and all that. And so we've managed these ditches for the last 80 years. We think the, the department's just simply wrong to put this burdensome red tape on farmers when a system's already worked great for many years. Swazinski has frustrated the state's roadside maintenance costs may increase if the work done by farmers in exchange for hay is delayed until late summer. However, state officials say the various interest groups will meet in the coming year to discuss the best strategy. Ideally, we'd like to have a, you know, a vegetation management plan for our roadsides and doing maintenance when it's called for, when it's right to get the desired result that we want. And I'm not saying that haying isn't a portion of that. Haying is a, a management technique that can be used. It just has to be done at the right time. But defining that right time is where much of the dispute lies. At that time of year, uh, especially a year like this, where in our area we're very dry, the quality of the feed is, is deteriorated by that point. Any grasses that you're paying, as they mature and ripen, they become woody and dry and uh, become less, less feed value and less palatable for the animals. 
Neighboring South Dakota requires farmers in certain counties to wait on haying ditches until after June 15th or July 10th at the latest. Iowa allows those with a permit to bale hay along certain roads after July 15th. Minnesota farmers worry that leaving ditches unmowed until August could lead to the maturing, seeding, and spreading of noxious weeds. The invasive species, mainly the Canadian thistle, is huge in Minnesota. Take over the ditches and then it spreads into our fields and spreads into the other ditches. But Minnesota officials say state maintenance crews could mow ditches earlier in the summer on a case-by-case -case basis. Farmers harvesting hay also have, at times, inadvertently hampered state road crews' efforts to manage weeds. They'll go through and they'll apply herbicide and um, no more than two hours later, there's a farmer in there haying it. Proponents argue that several species, including the monarch butterfly, whose numbers are dwindling, have lost too much tall grass habitat in Minnesota. The state did lose about 700,000 acres of CRP ground between 1992 and 2012. However, over those two decades, much of the rural land went to new development, which increased by roughly 400,000 acres. The state also saw a slight increase in forest and pastureland acreage, while cropland decreased slightly. Farmers argue that unmowed ditches may mean motorists fail to see approaching deer and other wildlife, creating the potential for more accidents. Many established producers also worry that the younger and smaller acreage farmers will take the brunt of the delayed hay harvest. I've got a neighbor down my road from my main farm uh, who he works in town as a plumbing and heating guy, but he also loves agriculture. He bought this acreage with his wife to raise a few goats on and some cattle, and quite frankly, he doesn't have the land to go out and just put up hay for winter. Todd Thompson, who farms near East Chain, Minnesota, does harvest hay from the ditches adjacent to his land, but wouldn't be heartbroken if he lost the option to mow earlier in the summer. If he had to spend several hundred dollars for a new insurance policy, he would stop haying ditches. Oh, you're just in a tractor and you're at, on an angle, you know, and something could happen, something could break down, you might tip over. It's dangerous and it's hard. As the interested parties debate the issue in the coming year, Minnesota will be under the legal microscope. A lot of the other states were actually watching Minnesota this year um, to see how everything would pan out. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. Next, the Market to Market Report. It was a one-two punch of limited demand and timely rains keeping a lid on most commodities. For the week, the September wheat contract lost seven cents and the nearby corn contract moved 13 cents lower. A strong soybean oil market kept the complex afloat with a two penny gain in the nearby contract. December meal lost 50 cents per ton. In the softs, December cotton added 87 cents per hundred weight. Over in the dairy parlor, September class three milk futures soured four bits. Livestock had a mixed week as the October cattle contract rose $1.03 and nearby feeders went 290 higher. The October lean hog contract fell 305. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index declined 68 basis points. Crude oil shed 79 cents per barrel. Comex gold increased 630 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs commodity index gave back just over two points to finish the week at 378.90. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Darren Newsom. Darren, welcome back. Thank you, Paul. And uh, in case you want to go over things again that Darren says or anybody else, you can listen to our Market Analysis and Market Plus podcast anytime online at iptv.org slash mtom. Now, Darren, I know you like to study history. Mm -hmm. About a year ago, you sat right there and told Mike, we shouldn't plant any acres of wheat. Mm -hmm. We almost got your wish with a horrible drought in many areas and reduced the number of, of good producing acres and good producing fields. Wheat, though, had a nice run up, but now we've just seen it. We're seeing a huge crop in Russia, more adding to those global stocks. Is there any light at the end of the tunnel for wheat in the near term? Well, it's interesting you should mention 
light at the end of the tunnel because this week, you know, as the, as the piece earlier said, we saw something extraordinary happen. And that was that we'd actually closed higher two days in a row in one week, which was Thursday and Friday. Is there a light at the end of the tunnel for wheat? Um, no, I don't think so. You know, we saw the, the smallest wheat acreage in what someone said 90 years, 100 years, something like that, planted last fall. I have no idea what we're going to plant this fall, but regardless of what's planted, Wheat's still in trouble. I mean, we can look at the futures basically being about as low as they've been over the last 10 years. Yeah, we've got a little bit of a bump you know, here recently, but it's given most of it back. We look at hard red winter uh, national average basis, which is a disaster. We're still talking about a dollar plus uh, in many locations. We, we're seeing cash prices hovering around government loan. So that brings LDPs back into play, possibly. Something we haven't talked about right, in 10 years. Right, a long time. Um, is there light at the end of the tunnel? I guess if we just want to phrase it that, how much worse can it get? Um, but really, there, there isn't anything out there right now that says wheat's getting ready to turn a corner. I mean, we went through a drought this year uh, in, this, in the northern plains and we reduced spring wheat, and that helped pull the winter wheat up. But the minute that we got close to harvest and spring wheat, winter wheat just came right back down. So it's going to be tough. It's, it's going to continue to be very tough in the wheat complex. And that's near term. Long term, not much better either. You're not really giving much optimism there. You know, the weird thing is if I look at the monthly charts in, in wheat, uh, in, in both Chicago and Kansas City winter wheat, they're trying to show uptrends. I don't necessarily believe it, uh, but they're trying to show long term uptrends so that maybe they're going to try to build here. I don't see any up in that chart right now, except no. for that little period. <laughs> you, you have to go it's way to out. Yeah. <laughs> you have to go way out. Uh, but, yeah, I, I don't really believe that yet. It's got to prove it to me, uh, both futures and cash. You know, if, if we can't hold near where we are right now, uh, here at the end of August, then maybe by the end of fall, early winter, we're back down to where we were a year ago at this time. And when wheat is poor performing, usually corn goes with it. Mm -hmm. And corn, again this week, a nearly 4% loss in the mm -hmm. near term. Why? There's no reason for it to go up right now. We've gone through the July weather, so that's not an issue anymore. As you said, we've just seen September corn, old crop corn, and December new crop both go to new contract lows. Uh, money is bailing out of the corn market because the last piece of news... Uh, official piece of news at the corn market guys that we're going to have plenty of corn. We're going to have big yield, big production. So money has been coming out of corn. There's nothing else out there. I know we've got crop tours going on. I know we've got some export demand still going on, but it's not enough. Yeah, you mentioned the crop tours. They have really only solidified USDA's latest report on mm -hmm. this. We're seeing timely rains in the right spots, little pockets mm -hmm. of drought are not enough to sway this market. And if you're sitting there looking at a field that looks terrible and you're saying, Darren, it looks awful here, yeah. why is the market not responding? Because it hasn't had an official update to respond. In other words, it has nothing to point at and say, look, crop production's actually coming down. Right now, we're still on schedule for adding to this five years in a row of the largest production numbers that we've ever seen. You know, we're going to be down from last year, maybe even from the year before that, but it's still going to be in the top five. So until we get a piece of news, that, you know, the situation that we've developed for ourselves, that until we get that piece of news that says production's not going to be as large as what was earlier forecast, market has no reason to rally. It wouldn't have mattered if the, if the tours came in and said, you know, we're just going to see a huge reduction from last year. It's still not official notification and markets wouldn't, won't react. Therefore, the markets won't react. And exactly. even on the, on the deferred, you mentioned it earlier, the, the deferred market's not any better. No, I mean, if we look at it, we've got some pretty strong carry, particularly in the December to March future spread. Uh, that strengthened this week. That's a little bit of a concern. I think it went out to like 12, 13 cents. That's a, that's a concern. Uh, that's showing that not only are we still expecting a large harvest, but now we've got the last remnants of old crop moving in. And so we've got all those supplies 
all of the new crop supplies that are supposed to come in, and I think this is really going to start weighing on bases. Well, and you bring up a couple of points there. We're emptying the bins. Mm -hmm. Last year we saw the low at the end of August. Mm -hmm. We're approaching that real quick. But is it time to go? It could go lower. Is it time to pull trigger on some sales? You know, I, I hate to I hate to pull the trigger after you know in the middle of this type of, of sell off. But you bring up something interesting. Last uh, last August we did post a low, but it was actually lower than the previous low in October 2014. And the chartist is going to tell you if you've got a series of higher excuse me lower highs and lower lows, which is what we've had going back to 2014, that's a downtrend. And so. If indeed, and we did in both the cash and futures, go to lows below what we saw in, uh, in October of 2014, that would suggest that yes, we should be able to get back down to those August 2016 lows. And if we don't want to ride that train all the way back down, then we may have to make some sales when we don't want to. Mm, unfortunate there. Uh, if you're in the soybean market, uh, beans, uh, the bean oil has mm -hmm. uh, helped it a little bit. Is that, that kind of let off on Friday? Is there any other future hope? Uh, fundamental or even technical that's going to help this market. Here we've got the Malaysian palm oil uh, really is one of the catalysts for soybean oil going higher. We've seen a nice rally in the Malaysian palm oil market and that's what's pulled up bean oil. Will that be enough to support soybeans? Probably not. Uh, soybeans are still the driver. Sometimes bean, uh, bean oil will go out on its own. Bean meal tends to track pretty closely uh, with soybeans itself, but bean oil can be that odd character in the complex that, that starts to work. It's like natural gas in the energy complex, just does its own thing. Uh, so it doesn't, you know, it's not overly surprising or overly unusual that we're still seeing a, a pretty solid uptrend in the bean oil market, whereas soybeans, soybean meal are both struggling at this point. Time to make sales, uh, either near term or sell something off uh, in December. No, because I don't. I'm not convinced that the soybean market is as bearish as what we're being told. Um, I'm anxious to see what comes out at the end of September, the September 30th, actually the September 29th uh, quarterly stocks report, which talks about what was on hand at, uh, as of September 1. I'm interested to see what that number is for soybeans, and I don't think it's going to be in this 370 million bushel range, which is what we were told in the August report. I think in September that's going to come down in the supply and demand report, and then again in the quarterly stocks. So I think you know, soybeans may try to hold in here if they don't. If they can't hold this area where we are right now, no, probably going to come down to nine. If that nine doesn't hold, we're talking about eight and a half. Yeah. Uh, I do want to ask you about cotton, but that's going to have to wait until the Market Plus, especially how it relates to Harvey. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll ask you about that in the Market Plus. And I do want to talk about the, the livestock complex, Darren. And uh, this week with... Uh, with the cattle, we have seen, uh, they had a good early week, mm -hmm. held off a little bit of a sell-off on Thursday, rallied back again on Friday. Uh, why? Box beef is one thing I've read. Mm -hmm. What else is it? Well, to me, it's more of just investment money coming back into the market. We've seen some of that. Because if we actually look at the spread, showing that we've got some commercial selling going on, and that's not good for the cash market. So I don't know that this can last all that long. Still got a downtrend going on weekly charts. So I think we could start to see some of the, the live cattle and feeder cattle start to come under pressure again. Nice little bounce here at the end of the week. I'm just not sure it'll hold all that far into next week. And with feeders, uh, there's reports of people keeping, maybe they don't have as many animals as were mm -hmm. initially reported. They're keeping them now that they've gotten rain. They're putting them mm -hmm. back into pasture that is greened up. I mean, I think I saw two feet of rain have fallen in Oklahoma just in the last month. So there are cattle feeding areas uh, that are doing positive. Mm -hmm. Can they hold, can make that uh, a run, or is that bad news for feeders? You know, I, long term, I still like the cattle complex, both live and feeder cattle. So I think that's going to come into it, and I think long term, that's probably going to help provide some support to the feeder market. And we'll see them and, and maybe hold them off coming into, mm -hmm. but they might be heavier then, and that causes its own set of problems. Then that gets back into the live cattle market. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's correct. Okay, hogs, uh, again, uh, up and down another three dollars off mm -hmm. this week. That's uh, that is nearly four and a half percent. What's mm -hmm. going on there? Selling from both sides. I mean, we've got the cash market weakening. We've got the investors bailing out of this market after that spike a couple weeks ago. So you know, really, this is something that we could see coming on the charts. It actually happened. Hogs can act a little bit weird. They can throw a lot of false signals out there, but this one actually uh, followed through. Now we've got it 
kind of in free fall mode here. And I think what's going to have to happen is we're going to have to have the commercial buying come back in, provide that level of support, and see if we can get this thing to hold. Well, is this the opportunity for commercial buying to come back in? Because they, they, it's a much better deal for yeah. them than it was a month ago. Might give it another week or two. Um, let this thing, because uh, hogs really like to overextend themselves, either going up or going down. So I think we could see another week or two of this market uh, moving lower. So if you're buying to feed in hogs or livestock, this is a good opportunity to be buying, mm -hmm. whether you want to feed wheat or feed corn. Mm -hmm. Is it time to cover some of those feed needs? You know, I, I no hurry. Uh, wheat's not really going anywhere. Corn, it's not going to go anywhere yet. Uh, I would be very surprised. Again, let's see what we do here at the end of the month. But, you know, if you need to get some coverage on, get some feed coverage on, by all means do it. But right now I would just uh, buy on an as-needed basis and wait to see if we get some sort of buy signal, long-term buy signal in either of these markets. All right, uh, final seconds on the dollar. Uh, again, this week uh, back down. Mm -hmm. uh, what's moving that? You know, I'm still a long-term dollar bear. I think we need to see this, this, uh, the dollar continue to work lower. Now it comes down to what's going to happen with interest rates later in September and possibly December. We'll see how it plays out. Darren Newsom, thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you, Paul. And uh, that will do it for the broadcast portion of Market to Market. Darren and I, though, will keep the conversation going. Remember, we're going to talk cotton, answering more of your questions during Market Plus, available in podcast and video form, available on our website. And while you're there, check out the link to our Facebook page of IPTV Market. This week... We've been posting some of our best from the Iowa State Fair, including tractor pulls and big animals. Those are really good videos to watch. Join us again next week when we'll explore how a key ingredient in a growing market is hard to price. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Paul Yeager. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Wherever your operation takes you, or who you share it with, we'll be where we've been all along. With you, from the word go. Proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.